Greetings and welcome back, gentles and ladies, men, to another fantastic episode of Remake or Rebreak. I'm X Paradigm Gamer, and yeah, it's been a while. I don't know what to say. Life's just crazy sometimes. And furthermore, you're probably wondering where the hell is Super Mario Deluxe? I thought that was next. Well, long story short, I was getting bored of the mediocre marathon, and so I made an executive decision. I wanted to move on to some 3DS stuff. We can go back to some mediocre remakes later. But for right now, I wanted to do something a little bit more engaging. Also, from now on, I'm going to be doing production updates and polls and all that sorts of stuff in the community tab because I don't want it to, you know, pad out the beginning of these videos because it's been getting ridiculous. To make sure that you're subscribed for those, go to the subs go to my channel page, go to the subscription button, and right next to it there's a bell. Uh, click into that, and then there's a little checkbox that says Show Creator Posts. Uh, if you click that, then whenever I post something, you guys will get that in your subscription feed, and then we'll be all set. Alright, with all that said, today's topic is obviously Ocarina of Time. Nintendo developed The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, or Double OT as I prefer to call it, concurrently with Super Mario 64. The initial plan was to release it on the N64 disk drive, though development was eventually transferred to the OG N64 hardware with plans to release additional content via the N64 disk drive expansion. Let's put a pin in that for later. An ambitious attempt to transform the top-down Zelda formula into a free-roaming 3D adventure game, the Ocarina experiment paid off with impressive sales figures and unanimous critical acclaim. Critics have consistently recognized Ocarina of Time for its impact on 3D game design, with many heralding it as one of the greatest games ever made. Twenty years later, however, many players will now question the game's solidified bagot status, arguing that the game doesn't rank well compared to its 3D successors and 2D predecessors. As always, I'll be sure to offer my own two cents in that question, but it's important to note that I wasn't there for the hype surrounding the game's development and release. Having read testimonials of those who were there at launch, it seems Ocarina of Time was nothing short of earth-shattering. Despite playing Super Mario 64 at five years old, Ocarina's initial release passed me by, and it wasn't until the game came out on the Wii Virtual Console that I finally played the game for myself. Some may argue that this would disqualify me from reviewing it, and I sharply disagree. If Double OT truly is one of the greatest games ever made, it should hold up in 2018 regardless of whether I was there to experience it in 1998. After all, that's what best game of all time means, otherwise we just say best game of 1998. To truly stand that test of time and solidify its role as one of gaming's greats, Double OT must be able to stand up to evolving tastes and should retain its appeal when separated from the time period it premiered in. While I will absolutely respect Ocarina of Time for its impact on the industry regardless, this review will rely on a holistic assessment of the game's design as I experience it in 2018. Of course, like any review, this video represents only my own subjective thoughts. But if that isn't a critical approach to this game you can gel with, then maybe this isn't the video for you. Now, that said, the original isn't all we're here to talk about. After the game's initial publication, Nintendo released the N64 disk drive, which flopped so hard and so quickly that it became a Japanese exclusive accessory. Nevertheless, Nintendo had developed an Ocarina of Time expansion called Ura Zelda, which never saw release until Ocarina of Time Master Quest came out in the GameCube in 2002. This game debuted as a bonus for those who pre-ordered the Wind Waker. And yeah, I cheaped out on my copy, but at least the disc is real. This version of the game includes a GameCube port of the original Ocarina of Time, as well as a port of Ura Zelda, now titled Master Quest with dungeon redesigns. The vanilla Ocarina port makes some noteworthy changes over the N64 original, so I'll be covering the GameCube version both as a re-release and as an expansion to the original game. Fast forward to 2011, and the 3DS had just hit the market. Nintendo had developed a demo of Ocarina of Time for the 3DS to showcase the console's capabilities, and later expanded this into a full remake and released it in 2011. Compared to many re-releases I've looked at on this channel, Ocarina of Time 3D is highly regarded among Zelda fans and considered the de facto way to play the game today. It's certainly a lot less contentious than Majora 3D. As always, Remake or Rebreak is a review segment where I evaluate the classics of the past to see how well 
well they hold up today, with a special emphasis on how well subsequent significant re-releases, which include ports, remakes, remasters, reimaginings, etc., recreate and improve upon the original experience. Today, we'll focus on four questions. How well does Ocarina of Time stand today as a game on its own? How does the GameCube version compare to the original 1998 release? How well does the Master Quest expansion build upon the original game? And finally, how does the 3DS version compare to the previous releases? This is The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time Remake or Rebreak. Alright, so with all that said, what exactly is the plot to this game? For the sake of review, I will have to spoil up to the midpoint of the story, so if you want to play the game spoiler-free, now's the time to click away. The story begins when our protagonist Avatar, Link, learns from a dying Great Deku Tree that a Gerudo thief named Ganondorf is searching for Hyrule's three spiritual stones. With these stones, Ganondorf could enter the Sacred Realm and steal the Triforce, three sacred triangles which would give him ultimate power to rule the world. With the spiritual stone of Forest in tow, Link infiltrates Hyrule Castle and partners with the young Hylian Princess, Zelda, to find the spiritual stones before Ganondorf does. Just as Link recovers the last stone, however, Ganondorf attempts to steal the Ocarina of Time, which is also necessary to open the door to the Sacred Realm. Fortunately, Zelda manages to escape, secretly passing the Ocarina onto Link. Link opens the doorway to the Sacred Realm and pulls a resting Master Sword from its pedestal. Tragedy strikes, however, when the sword seals Link away, allowing Ganondorf to claim the Triforce and become the King of Evil. An elderly sage named Roru explains to Link that the sword sealed him away so he could come of age to take on Ganondorf as an adult. In the meanwhile, however, Ganondorf has used the Triforce's power to take over Hyrule and wreak havoc on its inhabitants. Traveling back and forth through time with the Master Sword, Link sets out to locate the Six Sages of Hyrule and join forces with them to defeat Ganondorf and restore peace to Hyrule. On its surface, the story is fairly similar to Link to the Past, featuring many similar beats, and I'm certainly not the first reviewer to mention that. It's hard to miss the similarity of collecting three McGuffins to get the Master Sword, or the need to rescue seven mystical people to create a rainbow bridge to the final dungeon. When you really think about it, however, pretty much every Zelda game either follows the Zelda 1 formula of eight dungeons right off the bat, the two-act Link to the Past approach, or the Majora's Mask five dungeon structure. This franchise tends to recycle plot structures, so it's nothing especially distinct to Ocarina of Time. As for my impressions of the plot itself, well... I'm a bit mixed. On paper, this is an effectively written story. If you've been watching my recent Spyro 2 Let's Play on EPG Plays, <laughs> you'll know I discussed the purpose of story in gaming, which is to contextualize gameplay so it doesn't come off as a laundry list of arbitrary tasks. One way to go about this is the so-called Gruntilda effect, where you build up a threatening, powerful, and charismatic villain. When done correctly, the player becomes interested in defeating them, which motivates and contextualizes gameplay. Ganondorf in this game is an excellent example of this trope done right. Ocarina takes its time building up Ganondorf as a threatening villain who must be stopped, both in the context of the main story and in conversations with side characters. During the first act, Ganondorf wreaks havoc across Hyrule in search of the Sacred Stones, even going so far as to sentence an entire race to starvation. After becoming the evil king, Ganondorf's malice intensifies, leaving a ruinous castle town in his wake and unleashing monsters across the land. Ganondorf himself is highly motivated and showcases a brand of over-the-top villainy most will enjoy. While I think Ganondorf was at his best in Wind Waker, he's certainly an effective villain in this game and an example of what Ripto should have been. I also enjoy how Ocarina of Time expands the Zelda universe, even if these have become taken-for-granted mainstays over the past 20 years. Species like Zoras, Gorons, and Gerudo all make their first appearances here. Double OT also provides a backstory for the ongoing struggle between Ganondorf, Link, and Zelda, and how they all relate to the Triforce, which is later expanded and or retconned in Skyward Sword in particular. Another interesting aspect for me was seeing how side characters like Impa, Darunia, and Princess Rudo changed and grew over seven years. There's a clear theme of growing up and coming into one's destiny here, which is especially evident with Rudo's arc in particular. Before I get into some of my criticisms, I wanted to also discuss one of my biggest positives, that being the ending. Ah, oh, spoiler alert! Regardless of any negatives I may have, the final battle with Ganondorf is about as pitch perfect as it possibly could have been. While the final bosses are both pretty easy and formulaic, they serve their narrative purpose well, and the final face-off with Ganondorf pays off excellently in all the build-up. The ending even has a short little escape sequence to ratchet up the tension that much further. And after the battle is won, you get this 
excellent ending sequence with an amazing staff roll medley that shows the denizens of Hyrule celebrating Ganondorf's defeat and rebuilding on their own terms. Though I never really got why Navi leaves at the end, it kind of comes out of nowhere and you'd think that after all these two have been through they'd be friends for life, but apparently not. Regardless, I just wanted to give credit where it's due. The story in Ocarina may not be high art or anything, but at least on paper it is very effective at motivating gameplay, and the ending succeeds in rewarding you with what you'd want to see after such a long adventure. So yeah, there are definitely positives here, and the story successfully performs its intended function. It's the presentation, however, where Ocarina really starts to show its age. For the most part, I do think the actual gameplay does hold up well enough, but I'm not even joking when I say that my single greatest criticism of this game boils down to two words text speed. I don't care that Ocarina uses text boxes to communicate the story at a time when voice acting was an industry standard. There were technical limitations at play, and let's face it, the voice acting probably would have sucked anyway. No! What I do care about is how Ocarina ignores taken-for-granted features of similarly text-heavy games from that time period. In a little-known game called Final Fantasy VI, for example, you can adjust the speed of text boxes in the pause menu. And hey, if nothing else, skippable text was something Mega Man and Base got right, and that game came out seven months before Ocarina of Time. Though 1991's Link to the Past didn't have a text speed slider, it at least loaded full text boxes nearly instantaneously. Ocarina of Time Time, meanwhile, decided that it was absolutely necessary to slowly load every single character on screen one by one. There is no way to adjust the text speed in the menu, nor can you skip through dialogue or full scenes using the face buttons. This may sound like a subtle problem, but it really does kill pretty much any goodwill I have for the story. Well structured plot or not, if I have to wait ages for the game to load every text box, it destroys the pacing and makes every single conversation in the game an endurance test. Playing through the game four times for this review definitely definitely didn't help, but even during my first bout on the N64, I found myself hopelessly alternating between the A and B buttons in the vain hope that it would somehow make it go faster. And guess what? Sometimes it actually did. Yeah, a select few cutscenes will scroll like lightning if you press the B button, which always comes as a shock because there's no rhyme or reason as to when you can do this. This proves that the slow text speed was a deliberate design choice on the developer's part. Why they did this is anyone's guess but even during my first playthrough on the Virtual Console in 2007, it made this game come off as so much more dated and slowly paced than it would have otherwise. It doesn't help that a lot of the cutscenes are boring to look at as far as cinematography goes. Cutscenes often linger on flat medium angles of the characters and fail to compose visually interesting shots. There are exceptions, like the first meeting with Zelda, which cleverly utilizes multiple angles, but even this is ruined with a close-up on these ugly 2D flowers. Maybe I could excuse the slow text speed if this game was light on cutscenes, but Ocarina seems to go out of its way to punish you with as many unnecessary, slow-moving conversations as possible. I'm not sure why I never noticed this before, but the first third of Ocarina where you play as Child Link is pretty dull. There are several interlocking reasons for this, so let's start from the top. Early on, the game constantly dumps exposition and tutorials on you about this or that, and a lot of it is stuff you'd probably already know if you've ever played a Zelda game before. It is useful information on a first playthrough, but by the second, you just wish you could mash your way through it and get on with the next dungeon. The tutorials themselves are also a massive pace breaker and remind me a lot of Alia from Mega Man X5. Much like Alia, Navi constantly halts your progress to tell you things that are self-evident to any competent player. While I'd agree with my reviewer friends that mashing through Alia's dialogue doesn't solve the underlying problem, at least there you could mash your way through the dialogue and move on with your day. Imagine playing a version of Mega Man X5 where you couldn't do this, 
and were text boxes loaded even slower. That is what Ocarina of Time feels like, and you feel that slog in repeat playthroughs. There's a reason why everyone hates Navi and that godforsaken owl. Is it really necessary to grind the game to a halt so Navi can warn me about wall masters on the ceiling for the fifth time? Do I really need to watch the carpenters slowly recount the same spiel about being locked up four times? This would have been the perfect placement for a B button skip, guys. For some reason you can B skip the owl tutorials, thank god, but the annoying pissant still has the nerve to show up everywhere. Back in 1998 when 3D Zelda gameplay was new, these forced conversations served a purpose, but in 2018 they only amount to a constant, irritating pace breaker. The text speed isn't the only thing dated about the presentation, seeing as the actual dialogue as written hasn't really aged that well. This is something that's kind of hard to substantiate, but if you've played this game within the past 10 years, you know what I'm getting at. The game's attempts at comedy, especially, just come off as stilted and awkward. There was only one comedic scene to my recollection where I laughed, and judging by the footage you can probably guess which one. It might seem like I'm nitpicking at this point, and honestly I am, but the slow text speed only accentuates these irritating quirks. The bottom line is that these flaws prevented me from investing myself in the story. As we discussed in the Unverse Cast episode on Kingdom Hearts 2, <laughs> <laughs> Emotional engagement draws you into the world and makes you interested in the outcome, and that's what the text speed fouls up the most. From the very beginning of Link to the Past, the visuals and music tug at your emotions and give you a sense of what's at stake if Aghanim succeeds in his plans. Aril's kidnapping in Wind Waker performs a similar function. The closest Ocarina comes to an emotional response is when Ganondorf captures the Gorons and threatens to feed them to a dragon in a display of power. But even this is relayed with yet another punishingly slow, visually flat conversation with an NPC. Despite the game's best efforts, the slow text speed constantly breaks my immersion while the dated, stilted attempts at comedy further cheapen the authenticity of the characters. I don't feel like I'm watching characters I care about overcome an interesting conflict. I feel like I'm watching character models in a video game bombard me with sterile, expository dialogue. I'm sure there are people out there who never notice the text speed issue and may consider it a minor problem at best. And to that I say, fair enough. Your mileage on this issue may vary, and I'll confess to being more impatient than most people. But the fact is that later Zelda games have skippable text, or at least allow you to fast forward a bit, and so do most text-based games for that matter. Nowadays, we have reason to expect better, and so Ocarina's slow, unskippable text comes off as a dated design choice in 2018. Bottom line, the story on paper is well-structured and effective, but the execution is wanting. Ugh. Well, obviously the story leaves a little to be desired, but surely the visuals must be great, right? Well, at least I have a spoonful of sugar to help that medicine go down. That's right, folks. I'm now the proud owner of a Sony PVM. Thanks to the pass-through feature, I can even play games here while passing the RGB signal along to my OSSC and FrameMeister for recording. All the N64 footage in this review was recorded from authentic hardware using an RGB SCART mod, played on the PVM, and digitized using the open source ScanMeister. I've even sampled the N64's horizontal smoothing feature for greater accuracy. That said, even playing on a CRT can't salvage the visuals in this game. I'm gonna be blunt when I say that Ocarina of Time is graphically unappealing. Even for a 1998 N64 game. To me, the bad visuals speak for themselves, but I'm prepared to defend my stance. I'm aware that dated visuals are somewhat inevitable for 3D games released over 20 years ago, but Ocarina should at least look as good as other games released that year. Some other, much better looking 3D games also released in 1998 include Crash Bandicoot Warped, Mega Man Legends, Spyro the Dragon, Banjo Kazooie, Metal Gear Solid, and Glover. Another thing that all these 1998 games have in common is that you're allowed to skip through or otherwise speed up cutscenes in some capacity, but 
I digress. I previously criticized the graphics in Mario 64, but at least that game had a healthy palette of bright colors and a breadth of visually interesting stages. Ocarina of Time doesn't even match up to this launch title. And this isn't just an issue of linear games being easier to make look appealing on 5th generation hardware. Banjo-Kazooie and Spyro the Dragon are both as free roaming as can be and are way better looking games. Honestly, for Zelda, this really isn't anything new. To this day, console 3D Zelda games always seem to be far behind their contemporaries when it comes to visual fidelity. While Wind Waker has held up better than most of them, it still has a lot more dithering and blurrier backgrounds than you remember. Even with this in mind, however, Ocarina's visuals are still pretty weak for a first party game. To give credit where it's due, I do think the character models fare overall better than Super Mario 64's, avoiding the use of obvious linked primitives. The stylized character designs in particular go a long way here. There are a few dated looking models like these fire slugs, but then you also have models like Morpha and Ganondorf that somehow look way better than everything else. I'd also say that the 2D menu assets also hold up reasonably well. Sadly, that's where the positives stop. The environments look blocky and chunky even by N64 standards, and the texture work is bland and lacks detail. One of the advantages of the N64 was its use of bilinear texture filtering, used to disguise the aliasing and angle warping common in most PlayStation games. When used effectively, you can get some great results from it. Ocarina of Time, meanwhile, often takes low resolution textures and smears them across large surfaces, which results in some pretty ugly environments. Compare this to Banjo Kazooie, which used a clever tiling system, and you get significantly more detailed environments that cleverly utilize the filtering. Then there's all the other dated modeling aspects cone shaped tunnels, flat textured on staircases, polygonated bottles, those tiny teardrop shaped shadows attached to Link's feet, flat textured on holes in the ground. I'm not expecting Ultra HD graphics folks, but this is well below the standards of 1998. Lots of games at the time relied on billboarded 2D sprites to substitute for 3D models. It was a necessary evil of the time period, but most games were clever enough to restrict this to round objects that would require too many polys. Ocarina uses this trick for everything from item drops to even level geometry, and it's so obvious that these are just low-res 2D sprites. But even this doesn't compare to the pre-rendered environments. Good god, why? It's so jarring to go from fully rendered environments to something that looks like it belongs to a completely different game. What about this couldn't have been modeled in full 3D? Pre-rendering actually takes up more cartridge space than geometry would, and it doesn't even look as good as the RPGs and survival horror games of the time. While I'm on the topic, the performance also leaves a lot to be desired. Nintendo 64 games are not known for having fluid, consistent frame rates, but Ocarina is particularly ignominious in this regard. Menus run at a noticeably faster frame rate, but for most of the actual game, you're dealing with a choppy 20 frames per second. It's not even a consistent 20 FPS, seeing as the game sometimes suffers slowdown or frame drops for seemingly no reason. How much more do I really need to say about the visuals in this game? The footage speaks for itself. Well, the visuals may suck, but hey, at least the soundtrack's pretty good. Yes, while I don't think Ocarina holds up that well visually, sonically it has definitely stood the test of time. Video Game Music Hall of Famer Koji Kondo returns once again to make history, this time we're using the sound font he developed for Star Fox 64 the previous year. Personally, I've never been partial to the instrumentation in Star Fox 64, compositions aside, but this sound font lends itself much more effectively to a fantasy adventure game. Couple a now fitting sound font with even stronger compositions, and you've got one of the series' most prominent musical out to date. This soundtrack is widely loved and discussed, and I share the community's enthusiasm for popular tracks like The Lost Woods, so I won't belabor that discussion too much. Nevertheless, I think the Ocarina compositions are the most impressive and what really elevate the soundtrack above others in the series. Every single one of these short tracks has been burned into gaming's collective consciousness, and it's amazing how much Koji Kondo accomplished with just five notes in a single scale. Even more impressive when you factor in Majora's Mask, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Point is, the soundtrack in this game is fantastic and truly timeless. Alright, so the visuals are pretty ugly, the presentation has some problems, and the soundtrack is actually pretty damn good, but what about the gameplay? 
there's no better place to start than with a simple question. How will this Ocarina of Time take the original Zelda formula and transition it to 3D? I used to view Ocarina as way inferior to its GameCube successors, but then I played a little game called Star Fox Adventures and realized just how much could have gone wrong in the 3D transition. Since then, I've come to appreciate Ocarina's game design a lot more. Double OT could have just as easily ended up like Crash Bandicoot or Metal Gear Solid, simply taking things that worked in 2D predecessors and playing them straight in 3D. We could have gotten something with the perspective and controls of, say, A Link Between Worlds, but Nintendo took the initiative to really rethink Zelda from the ground up in free-roaming 3D. Overall, their efforts pay off wonderfully. That's not to say there aren't things I might have done differently, but Ocarina's sheer innovation cannot be overstated. Unlike Mario 64, which adopted a brand new formula to overcome technical limitations, Ocarina doesn't likewise attempt to reinvent the wheel. Core gameplay elements are more or less intact from previous games. The main difference is that unlike the top-down structure of games 1, 3, and 4, game 5 now utilizes free-roaming 3D environments with a controllable camera. This one shift completely overhauls how environments are built and how dungeons are designed. Puzzles can now take advantage of 3D spatial awareness, and dungeons themselves can be structured in a more open-ended, less modular way than the grid-based system of previous games. I enjoy 2D Zelda as much as the next guy, but the underlying ideas and concepts just translate more naturally to 3D than to top-down 2D. Of course, a sound design doc would mean nothing without proper control and mechanics, and this is where Ocarina truly comes through. Thanks to the analog stick, Link controls admirably on foot. Three item shortcuts plus the context-sensitive A button and a dedicated sword button helps to avoid potential bugaboos and streamline the new 3D arsenal. An unfortunate drawback is that the C buttons cannot be used to control the camera, but thankfully Ocarina delivers an effective compromise. By pressing the Z button, Link can center the camera directly behind him, and surprisingly, that's all you really need. I kid not when I say that Mario 64 could have really benefited from a feature like this, and that's one of the reasons I prefer the DS version. On top of that, a lot of classic Zelda items were reinvented for the third dimension, and you'd be surprised how much more mechanically engaging they become. The bow and arrow, for example, was a pretty boring weapon in the 2D game, since all you really did was shoot it in four directions. Now we have a first-person aiming scheme and can hit any point of the room from any point. This allows for puzzles that test spatial awareness in addition to the ability to aim more precisely at enemies. This is part of what I meant when I said that the underlying ideas of 2D Zelda just work better in 3D, and it's also where Star Fox Adventure showcases what could have gone wrong. Imagine if Ocarina had eschewed the tight first-person aiming controls and instead utilized SFA's god-awful blaster controls. It might have sunk the game. Another thing that was overhauled between games involves fighting enemies. Combat in previous games was mostly a means to an end, and was definitely not the focus. Ocarina, by contrast, emphasizes fighting baddies considerably more, and this is partially due to the 3D transition. Keys, for example, are no longer restricted to the same plane, meaning you'll have to think about where they are in a 3D space and fight back accordingly. Beyond that, however, enemies often require a lot more strategy. While you can defeat most enemies with your standard sword, you're encouraged to experiment with items to make things easier. Link's sword play and defensive capabilities have similarly expanded. Not only can you pull off an assortment of swings and stabs, but you're also encouraged to use your shield to block enemy attacks and wait for openings. In a different game, combat could have been tedious, awkward, forced, boring, and one note. But Ocarina puts you in control of the pace of battle and offers worthwhile alternatives to simple button mashing. What really pulls it all together is the timeless Z-targeting system, which makes up for the lacking camera control by automatically focusing on your target, allowing you to strafe from attacks and conveniently aim your weapons. I cannot stress enough just how brilliant, essential, and ahead of its time this lock-on mechanic is. I can't imagine this game working without it. Mechanically, this game also innovates with... Well, the Ocarina of Time. Similar mechanics would later reappear in many Zelda games going forward. The Ocarina of Time is an all-purpose doohickey whose enchanted melodies can do everything from summoning your horse to fast traveling around Hyrule. Surprisingly, mostly thanks to Kondo's compositions, these warp songs are easy to play from memory. Personally, I still much prefer Majora and Wind Waker's approach of just having one warp song. While I enjoy the Ocarina mechanic overall, I can't tell you how many times I had to arbitrarily play Zelda's lullaby 
to make a door open or summon a chest. I never really saw the point of this, seeing as there's nothing really engaging here. The moment you see that Triforce symbol, the puzzle's basically solved itself. Master Quest has a great puzzle in the Spirit Temple where you have to take context clues and play the appropriate ocarina song in the designated spot. I feel like providing clues to a specific song would have been a better way to incorporate the ocarina into dungeons. And this is a nitpick, but because of how often you use it, you really do need to keep the ocarina equipped at all times. Which means for all intents and purposes, you really only have two item shortcuts. I don't really have a solution for this short of making the ocarina context sensitive, but I wanted to drop this breadcrumb for when we talk about the 3DS version. So in terms of taking ideas from previous games and reinventing them for the third dimension, I think Ocarina of Time succeeds with flying colors. But that doesn't mean everything works. One of the most consistently criticized aspects of the game is its overworld design, specifically Hyrule Field. Again, I've played Star Fox Adventures, where the only way to get to Cape Claw and back is to spend 10 minutes running through boring hallways. Needless to say, that game's navigation is dreadful and padded out. While Ocarina of Time avoids that specific problem, playing the game again reminded me of just how empty and needlessly expansive Hyrule Field is. It's not as bad as certain future games in the series, but it feels like the only thing it accomplishes is creating negative space between all the major Hylian landmarks. This is just another reason why the child portion of the game is so boring on repeat playthroughs. Even when Child Link isn't in text box purgatory with Zelda or getting owlsplained by Kapora Gabora, hashtag owlsplained, you're side jumping or back walking through Hyrule Field because it takes way too long to get anywhere. The fact that I even resorted to these tactics speaks volumes about the overworld design in this game. Every first time player will spend their first night killing stale children in Hyrule Field because it simply takes too long to just walk from Kokiri Forest to Castletown before the drawbridge lifts at nightfall. While I'm on the subject of forest time wasters, how about the part where you have to pointlessly wait around for a cuckoo to hatch from an egg? It's just another needless hoop to jump through whenever you replay the game. Oh, and don't think I've forgotten about you, King Zora. This is kind of funny for about five seconds, but it just keeps going and it takes forever. Oh yeah, and how about the part where after you go from the forest to the castle to meet Zelda, you're immediately sent back to the forest to get a song so that you can backtrack all the way to the mountain. That's why the child portion is so boring on repeat playthroughs. It's so highly delineated with hoops to jump through and you're not allowed to skip any of them. To be fair, there are some convenient fast travel passages, thank god, but they can only help so much. Thankfully, this is one of the things that improves dramatically in the adult half of the game. Not only can you immediately unlock a horse for significantly faster travel, but you can learn warp songs for your ocarina. While this is way better than hoofing it, the fast travel is still a clear downgrade to the flute from Link to the Past. You can't unlock a warp song until right before entering that area's temple, which means that convenient warp points like a Kiriko village take too long to become available. Even then, for some reason, Zora's River doesn't have a warp point at all, and it's one of the most cumbersome areas to reach on foot. Even the Lake Hylia fast travel passage gets frozen over. Bottom line, while the situation improves in the back half of the game, navigation in Ocarina of Time is often bloated and inconvenient, and it only gets worse in repeat playthroughs when paired with the whole tech speed problem. Thankfully, the dungeons overall fare much better, and this is where Ocarina of Time holds up the most. By 3D Zelda standards, the first three child dungeons are bearably average. There aren't a lot of clever puzzles, and progression is pretty obvious, making them more obstacle course than labyrinth per se. Jabu Jabu's belly is probably the best one, what with cutting tentacles to open new pathways, but this is mostly restricted to an upper area of the dungeon and nothing clever really comes of it. While dungeons are the best part of the child portion of the game, even these pale in comparison with the adult offerings. From the forest temple to the spirit temple, your wits and metal are amply tested with an assortment of clever puzzles and tricky enemies. The forest temple structurally breaks the mold by placing the path to the boss in the center room, locked behind the souls of the four Poe sisters. By exploring the dungeon, you eventually track down the sisters and light the way to the boss. Along the way, you'll have to search intently for small keys and navigate these twistable hallways. There are also plenty of engaging set pieces to speak of, making for an overall memorable and tightly designed dungeon. The rest of Ocarina's dungeon selection fares just as well, with each adding their own spin on the new 3D dungeon formula. The Spirit Temple is my personal favorite in the game, combining thoughtful progression with creative puzzles while still keeping a tight pace. I also thought the inclusion of the child gameplay was fascinating and unique. A lot of people aren't keen on the Water Temple, and I don't blame them, but personally I found the open-ended structure to be more engaging than the Shadow Temple, which is literally just a 
linear path with a bunch of branching side rooms you visit for small keys. At least the Water Temple made me think creatively about how to progress. With the Shadow Temple, I'm pretty much on autopilot from start to finish. People often criticize the use of the iron boots and hover boots in these respective dungeons, seeing as you have to open the equipment screen to toggle these abilities. This contrasts with Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, where iron boots were assigned to item hotkeys. Short of assigning some commands to the D-pad, which merely toggles the minimap, I don't think there was a good solution to this problem on N64. I found myself swapping around item shortcuts pretty consistently, so even if the boots were assignable, it wouldn't really cut down on the menu navigation all that substantially. I feel like they put their best foot forward on this one, but it is admittedly a minor pace breaker. As great as the dungeons are, bosses in this game are kind of a step down from their 2D ancestors. While all taking advantage of the third dimension, they're all far too easy once you've realized just how quickly jump attacks drain their health bar. The early bosses especially are mere child's play, which I suppose is appropriate. Boss fights do improve by the adult half of the game, with Phantom Ganon in particular standing out both in terms of challenge and strategy. Even then, I find that most bosses involve a lot of standing around and waiting for them to reveal their weakness, while you dodge largely ineffective attacks. I think Morpha is the best example of this. This boss is sinfully boring, and not an especially great climax to what many already consider an annoying dungeon. The attack cycles in general are very repetitive, and rarely do bosses get smarter or more aggressive over time. Even the final bosses, despite working very well in the narrative, have incredibly simplistic attack cycles and don't require that much thought or effort. While that covers the main stream of Ocarina's content, Double OT offers a plethora of side quest opportunities, and for the sake of review, I completed the lot. Did somebody say side quests? On the whole, I'd say these quests are worth pursuing for the extrinsic rewards if nothing else, but not all of them offer intrinsic satisfaction. Seeing as this is an adventure game and not a collectathon, I can settle for extrinsic benefits, but it's worth discussing some of these side quests in more detail. Four empty bottles return from Link to the Past, with one being part of normal story progression and two others becoming easy to acquire as early as the second dungeon. The fourth one, meanwhile, hides behind easily the worst side quest in the game, the Big Po Hunt. The quest itself requires other empty bottles, meaning you'll have to make a minimum of four trips to carry ten Big Po souls to this weirdo. Even once you figure out that Big Po's don't randomly spawn but rather appear in ten set locations in Hyrule Field, which the game really should have explained, this quest just amounts to galloping around Hyrule Field and rereading the same slow-ass dialogue over and over again. There's not really an ideal time during the main campaign to do this, so I inevitably always stave it off for the end, by which time the fourth bottle is no longer useful. Even during my 3DS run when I knew all the locations, I still had to spend 45 minutes making the minimum four trips. It's just a whole lot of hassle for not so great a reward. Beyond empty bottles, you also have 36 pieces of heart to find, again returning from Link to the Past. To collect these bad boys, you'll have to thoroughly explore the overworld and complete quests for NPCs. Personally, I much prefer this approach to increasing Link's health over completing a bunch of sterile, copy-paste mini dungeons. Not only does it do a much better job of packing the game world with meaningful content than collecting and selling an assortment of bland materials, but it also gives you an added incentive to get to know the Hylian populace, which in turn makes the world feel more fleshed out and lived in. The mini games in particular are generally fun and test your skills with Link's different items. My least favorite heart piece is probably Dampay's Grave Digging Tour, which is frankly just a big waste of money. Not that money is all that important in this game. Ocarina absolutely showers you with rupees, but unlike later games, there aren't many good places to spend it, and the starting wallet is pathetically small. Speaking of wallets, let's not forget about the lion's share of optional content, the gold sculptulas. These gilded creepy crawlies are hiding all across Hyrule, in and out of dungeons. There are a hundred in total, and whenever you defeat a certain number of them, you unlock a reward at the House of Sculptula. I actually think the side quest was really well executed in a way that can satisfy completionists and average players alike. You only really need to kill 50 of these critters to unlock a piece of heart, which for all intents and purposes is the last reward worth a damn. I find that if you're thoroughly exploring dungeons and listening for those telltale crawling noises, you can easily rack up 50 Sculptula tokens just by playing the game normally. After all, this isn't a collectathon. There's a delineated, satisfying core experience in the dungeons, and side content in adventure games really is more about the reward to begin with. Because of that, I can personally feel comfortable calling it at the halfway mark. However, if you're the completionist type like me, then you're gonna have your work cut out for you. If you're going for all 100 spiders, it's worth knowing that fully hunted areas will mark with a Sculptula token on your map. And this goes for dungeons as well. As far as I know, nothing in the game
game tells you about this, and I discovered it by accident myself when I was looking for the 100th token. It definitely made my second hunt in the 3DS a hell of a lot easier, so it's good to go in knowing that. Even then, there are an abundance of questionably hidden spiders that pretty much require a guide to uncover. Some of these are hidden in random trees or crates, requiring you to know that you can rock or destroy them with the roll move. Others only appear in the past or future, meaning your hunt will likely send you back and forth from the pedestal of time. This begs the question of why Link can't time travel at will. My least favorite bugs, however, are the ones requiring you to backtrack to child dungeons. Most of the dungeon sculptulas you can grab on your first visit, so these sculptulas felt out of place. There are also a handful of frankly obscure sculptulas that you'll never find without a guide. Maybe you can uncover them by using the Mask of Truth on the Gossip Stones or something, but who's honestly gonna think to play the Song of Storms next to a random tree to make a hole appear? Otherwise, I do get satisfaction out of looking for these varmints, but I wouldn't recommend getting them all unless if you want the bragging rights. At least the Sculptula Hunt nets you some useful rewards, in contrast to the bigger on trading sequence. Good luck completing this one without a guide, at least on N64. The sequence requires you to trade around items with NPCs across Hyrule, which does admittedly help to flesh out the world and characters. Like apparently these four characters here are all related. While most of the time the NPCs flat out tell you where to go, there are gaps in the side quests where you're left to figure out the next destination. For example, you're just supposed to know who the cuckoo lady's brother is. I looked it up instead. The worst parts of the sequence though are where you're asked to take an item from one one end of the overworld to the other within a time limit, which expires if you try to warp. As long as you have a Pona, you should clear these no problem, but it just amounts to more backtracking through the bland expanse that is Hyrule Field. After this seemingly random string of encounters, you don't even get your reward right away. You're forced to use the Sun Song six times or otherwise pass three in-game days, as though the side quest didn't have enough padding. Finally, you get your hands on the Bigron Sword, which does do more damage than even the Master Sword. Unfortunately, the quest itself is so long that I always find myself putting it off to the end. And much like the fourth bottle, the benefits of the Bigeron Sword largely expire by then. Granted, it is useful during a certain phase of the final boss, but that boss is already easy without it and hardly worth all the back and forth. I'm the Happy Mask salesman. I sell Happy Masks. Child Link can complete the Happy Mask trading sequence in the past. And it has a lot of the same problems. You have to sell each of these four masks to a specific NPC in the overworld, with the first person being explicitly spelled out. As far as the other three go, however, the game doesn't even bother with any clues out of the gate. You're just supposed to know who to sell the masks to. The reward for your trouble is the ability to talk to Gossip Stones and a couple optional masks. Black. There are a handful of other side quests for ammo expansions and other useful items, but most of them aren't really worth discussing. However, I do I think I need to mention the fishing minigame, because this ostensibly 10 minute side quest took me an hour. You could comfortably beat Big the Cat scenario in the time it takes. The most interesting one is probably the Gerudo Secret Training Ground, which is easily the most intrinsically satisfying side quest. If nothing else, you squeeze an extra dungeon out of the experience. Overall, the side content in this game is rewarding, but not really intrinsically enjoyable. Well, that pretty much covers the original, so let's move on to the GameCube version. Truth be told, there's not too much to say about the GameCube version as far as remake or rebreak goes. This version was recorded off my Nintendo Wii using an authentic disc, component cables, and upscaled using the OSSC Meister combination. For the sake of review, I only did a full playthrough of the Master Quest version on GameCube, but unlike my N64 run, I didn't bother completing all the side quests since it didn't seem necessary. Seeing as the only difference between Vanilla OT and Master Quest are the dungeon designs, a standard playthrough of Master Quest is sufficient to comment on any N64 to GCN differences. As far as I can tell, this version is not a port per se, but rather an enhanced emulation of the N64 ROM. After all, the point of this re-release was really more to get the disk drive expansion out into the wild, and the game itself was just a Wind Waker pre-order bonus and never sold for full price. However, even with these lowered expectations, I can't help but feel there was a lot of missed potential to improve upon the N64 version. The single greatest improvement to the GameCube version is 
increases the support for 480p progressive scan, which roughly quadruples the original's 240p resolution. This addition proves that even a GameCube emulation of Ocarina of Time could have featured gameplay and performance improvements, but unfortunately, it doesn't take advantage of most of them. The text still scrolls like molasses even when the ROM could have been patched, and the framerate is still clocked to 20 FPS during gameplay even though the GameCube could have easily rendered these assets at 30 FPS if not 60 FPS. Despite the resolution increase, none of the assets were updated to take advantage of the increased resolution. The pause menus even use 240p screenshots. These both seem like simple, obvious changes, even for an emulation. Even then, would it have been that hard to revise the control scheme? The GameCube version could have reassigned the item shortcuts to the X, Y, and Z buttons while allowing full camera control with the C stick. Instead, these extra face buttons merely correspond to the original C buttons, with the stick itself performing the same function. Have fun playing ocarina songs on an analog stick, by the way. But even this doesn't compare to trying to aim in first person. I've always found that other controllers don't do a good job emulating the N64 stubby analog stick, which is my personal hypothesis as to why so many newer players dislike the controls in Mario 64. The virtual console controls are just way inferior to playing on an actual N64 controller. Lots of people have criticized Ocarina's aiming control, but when playing the game on an authentic gamepad, I find that it's perfectly optimized. The GameCube version is a different story. The new stick is so much more sensitive than the old one, meaning that even slight taps to the stick cause the cursor to dart across the screen, making fast, precise shots out of the question. The same thing applies to the Virtual Console versions. Frankly, the GameCube version just comes off as lazy, and there's nothing more disappointing than wasted potential. So yeah, as far as GameCube re-releases go, this leaves something to be desired, to say the least. But to be honest, that's not really the reason we're talking about it. The reason to own the GameCube version of Ocarina of Time is Master Quest. It's worth noting that while what we know as the Master Quest expansion was developed under the Ura Zelda name, it would seem that there are plenty of ideas that were dropped during the original's transition to the Nintendo 64. While these elements were supposed to be brought back for the Ura Zelda expansion, all the finished Master Quest really amounts to on GameCube is a selection of redesigned dungeons. The story, overworld layout, and difficulty design remain the same as the original version, in contrast with the 3DS rendition. Because of that, there have been multiple restoration projects dedicated to recreating a playable Ura Zelda as it was originally envisioned. We're only here to talk about Master Quest as it was released, but I figured I'd mention it for those who weren't in the know. While Master Quest stops well short of completely rebuilding dungeons from scratch, it reuses the original dungeon geometry and textures, it does rearrange placeable objects and puzzles within said dungeon. Jabu Jabu's belly, for example, now features cows sticking out of walls which act as switches when struck with the slingshot. Shot. Needless to say, objects that didn't already appear in the original do not appear here, with the exception of these ice walls and blue-red switches, which probably went unused in the original. In that sense, you might consider Master Quest an official, glorified ROM hack. So how are these new dungeons exactly? One thing I do really appreciate about Master Quest is its creativity. The developers really zeroed in on the original's design quirks and created new puzzles that take advantage of them. For example, the Limbo Room the Deku Tree now requires you to duck by guarding using R, so you can then light the torch on the other side. Many dungeons similarly require you to bring lit Deku sticks from other rooms, which never occurred in the original. I also think that the child dungeons in particular are a nice improvement, involving much more thoughtful puzzles and unique progression. Dodongo's Cavern is an excellent example, with the shortcut elevator unlocking right away, essentially inverting the dungeon. Even the bottom of the well mini dungeon sees some improvements, requiring you to actually explore the whole dungeon to clear it. These clever new layouts made the otherwise tedious child portion of the game more enjoyable to replay. While gold sculptulas in the overworld can still be found in their original locations, dungeon sculptulas have found new hiding places in the Master Quest version. This too freshens up the experience, as formerly required rooms now become sculptula hiding places. That said, not all the changes were necessarily for the best, nor were all the puzzles satisfying to clear. In an ironic twist, most of these negative changes appear in the adult dungeons. I do still enjoy these dungeons on the whole, but they do have a few annoying quirks I wanted to discuss. For one thing, I hope you love fighting Stalfos Knights because Master Quest has a goddamn fetish for them. These guys are in every adult dungeon, and they're so defensive that you end up waiting around
around a lot. Iron Knuckles are a lot more common as well, but at least these guys can be a fun challenge with the risk reward element. Also, if you hated the Water Temple in the original, then get a load of the Master Quest Spirit Temple. It says a lot that Master Quest transformed my favorite Ocarina dungeon into my least favorite Master Quest one. There's just a lot of dickish, annoying puzzles in this place, especially the ones where you have to move crates across Song of Time blocks. Speaking of which, that's another fetish in this expansion, and it gets old really quickly. The icing on the cake is a puzzle where you have to smash a rusty switch as an adult to make a chest appear that you can only open in the past. Because that makes sense. I spent over two hours on this dungeon the first time through, and it didn't get any better on 3DS. Bottom line, if you're a fan of the original and are looking for something different, I think there's a lot to like about Master Quest. It's a clever reinterpretation that's worth playing for yourself. Well, now that we've got that mediocrity done and over with, it's time to look at a much better re-release. Ocarina of Time 3D. With that, we can finally move on to Ocarina of Time 3D, and I say we start by discussing the first thing you see, the graphics. For the sake of review, I did two full playthroughs of the 3DS version, a side quest inclusive vanilla run and an any percent master quest run. I recorded all the footage you're watching using my 3DS capture card. The N64 version outputted in a 320x240 frame subject to overscan, while the 3DS version outputs a 400x240 frame on the top screen and a 320x240 frame on the bottom. Thus, we aren't talking about a radical shift in resolution as opposed to the GameCube version. As always, I'd like to remind the folks at home that all portable 3D games, 3DS included, look aliased when properly upscaled. They are solely meant for and look good on their intended screens. While I'd hesitate to call Ocarina 3D the best looking game on the system, I'd say it's aged pretty gracefully over the past seven years, and the new visuals are an unequivocal improvement over the original. Character models are completely remodeled from scratch and textures are completely redrawn. The frame rate has also increased from 20 FPS to 30 FPS during gameplay, allowing for smoother animations and better player reaction. I did notice frame drops here and there, but compared to the occasional chugging in the original, it's insubstantial. Ocarina 3D strikes an appreciable balance between preserving the original art direction and updating the assets for 2011. NPCs, for example, retain their stylized character designs, from the Witch Sisters to that creepy lake scientist. Nevertheless, the models have been noticeably updated, and this is most obvious with the child characters. It's hard to describe how exactly, but these new models just do a much better job selling Link, Zelda, and Rudo's young age than the originals did. Also, I find that Ganondorf looks much angrier, making your first encounter with him actually kind of intimidating. The new texture work greatly increases the detail of the environments of the original, especially since they had the good sense to repeat tiles instead of smearing one tile across a large surface. Just take one look at the temples in this version and then look back at the original and it's a night and day improvement. Ocarina 3D has also largely abandoned the billboard and sprites from the original, with pickups now modeled in full 3D and flat planes kept to a minimum. Certainly there were some missed opportunities to improve even further. For example, staircases are still ramps with stairs textured on, because apparently we can't spare the extra polys. And the treasure chest textures in particular look noticeably low res. Link also retains his low lovely teardrop feet shadows when the 3DS was definitely capable of better. That said, there are still a few additional touch-ups here and there, like the reconstructed log tunnels in the Lost Woods or dirt mounds surrounding secret holes. Most importantly, the pre-rendered environments from the original now appear as fully modeled 3D environments with fixed camera angles, which was a smart compromise. Seriously, Hyrule Castle Town has never looked this good. Literally. Some of the later environments also have some neat texture effects, like these wall glyphs that light up when you get close. I think it's near incontrovertible that the 3DS visuals are leaps and bounds ahead of the original. It's not HD, that's for sure, but for 3DS, this game still looks great. As for the sound, there's not much difference to speak of. I mean, I guess they changed a couple sound effects. The rupees sound much more like they did in Link to the Past, for example. I also swear that they changed an instrument in the high real field theme, but otherwise we're talking the same samples and sequenced audio. Personally, I don't really have a problem with that, seeing as the original sounded great to begin with, but part of me wishes they went for a fully orchestrated soundtrack. The port credits use this amazing orchestrated medley of tracks from the game, and the Hyrule Field bit in particular sounds phenomenal. It's not the end of the world, but I know the 3DS is no stranger to pre-recorded music, and I'm sure Nintendo could have remastered the soundtrack if they wanted to. As for the story, 
there's barely any difference. The dialogue is entirely the same as far as I could tell, and the original animations and cinematography are preserved from the original. There is, however, one major difference, and you all probably saw this coming. The tech speed has been dramatically increased, and thank God for it. We're still not up to the standards of Twilight Princess, but we've at least gone back to the Link to the Past approach of instant load text boxes. Personally, with boxes this quick, I maybe would have separated out certain lines into separate boxes to retain the pace of the scenes, but at this point I'm just splitting hairs. I won't exaggerate when I say that I prefer the 3DS version for this reason alone. No, I'm not kidding, it really makes that much of a difference for me. While the child portion of this game is still kind of boring, Boring, in my opinion, the increased tech speed makes it a hell of a lot less painful on repeat playthroughs. I cannot tell you how cathartic it is to mash my way through the stupid fucking owl's useless tutorials, in the exposition dumps for that matter, not to mention the pointlessly repeated conversations. If you're actually interested in reading all this text, you can still do that, but if you're like me and just want to move on with your day, then you can mash B and be done with it. This way, everyone's happy. So right off the bat, we've already got quite a few major improvements to speak of, but believe it or not, we're only scratching the surface so far. Indeed, there are plenty of other gameplay improvements to speak of. Obviously, the 3DS has a radically different button configuration, as well as some unique features. The HUD has been moved to the bottom screen, which allows for a decluttered portable experience. Menus are similarly reviewed on the touchscreen, and items can be easily reassigned using the stylus. While we only have two shortcut buttons this time around, there are two additional slots in the bottom screen, including a dedicated slot for the ocarina. This means that you can keep items requiring instantaneity on the face buttons while keeping toggle items on the touch screen. Meanwhile, the ocarina itself never wastes a slot. This cuts down considerably on time spent reassigning item shortcuts, particularly in the water and shadow temples. Speaking of which, the iron and hover boots have become assignable items, allowing you to place them on the touch screen for toggling. The water temple itself updates the visual design to mark the way to the three water level placards, making for overall less confusing progression. The map has also been reassigned to the bottom screen and is just as effective for navigation and keeping track of Sculptulas as before. One surprising improvement is that the next destination in the Biggeron trading sequence is automatically marked on your map whenever you receive a new item, cutting down significantly on the guesswork. Unfortunately, this doesn't apply to the mask trading sequence, but still a welcome added convenience. In terms of fighting enemies, the 3D combat system transitions surprisingly well to the 3DS. Of course, we've got L targeting this time around, and unfortunately, this version was never updated to utilize the new 3DS's analog stick, unlike like Majora 3D. Regardless, I never had a problem with the camera controls in the original, and they work just as well here. Obviously, the 3DS sports a competent analog stick in the circle pad, so unlike with Mario 64 DS, there's no D-pad trade-off to speak of. Unlike the GameCube version, aiming is not only perfectly sensitive, but considerably enhanced thanks to the 3DS's gyroscope. By tilting the 3DS around, you can aim at enemies and switches with pinpoint accuracy and speed, making the woes of the GameCube and Virtual Console a thing of the past. Of course, you can always turn off the motion controls if you prefer. The ocarina has also been given a dual screen redux. The music bar is placed on the top screen and you're allowed to play songs with either the face buttons or the touch screen. If you don't feel like memorizing songs, you can also open them on the bottom screen and play them that way. Either way, the mechanic was well optimized for the new hardware. Similar to Skyward Sword, which released 5 months later, Ocarina 3D also sees the addition of the Sheikah Stone. I've barely touched the thing myself, but I entered it for the sake of review and it's basically a bunch of hint videos that show you how to solve puzzles and defeat certain bosses, with new videos unlocking as you progress. So, if you're ever confused about how to solve a certain puzzle, simply backtrack to Link's house or the Temple of Time and all will be revealed. Now, personally, I don't think this feature was necessary. For one thing, I think most players can make their way through dungeons and find their next destination without outside help. Even if they can't, I would sooner look it up on the internet than backtrack out of a dungeon to the Sheikah Stone. Thank Thankfully, you can go the entire game without using the Sheikah Stone and Frankly, that's what I recommend. Another interesting addition is the ability to refight defeated bosses. By resting in Link's bed in Kokiri Forest, you can pick from a list of bosses in a convenient menu. It would have been interesting to try refighting all bosses with weapons gained from future dungeons, but unfortunately you're limited to just what is necessary to defeat the boss itself. You're timed in how fast you can defeat each boss, which as far as I can tell is the only point of the mode. After re-defeating all the bosses in the time attack 
mode, you unlock a gauntlet where you try to beat the eight bosses on five hearts and a limited supply of items. After each boss, you get to choose from a big and small chest for random goodies. Personally, this mode just doesn't interest me all that much. I think a big part of it is that they left in the cutscenes, which is just a pace breaker when you want to get on with the next boss. That, and what's the point of having to unlock the gauntlet anyway? I already beat these bosses in the main story, so why do I have to fight them all again just to get the actual boss rush? While I didn't get that much out of this mode, it might be fun for those who want an extra challenge. As for me, it's just kind of boring. Alright, so this re-release is doing pretty well for itself so far. And just in case you thought that the GameCube version couldn't be any more redundant, guess what 3DS remake has Master Quest in it? By completing the vanilla Ocarina of Time on 3DS, you'll unlock the Master Quest expansion from the main menu, complete with three additional save files. I played to the credits in this version, and like my GameCube run, I didn't bother completing all the side quests. While you may think this would just be a straight port of the GameCube release, there are actually a few notable improvements. First off, the 3DS version retains all the enhancements from the vanilla experience, including the faster tech speed and improved item management. Second, much like the Wii version of Twilight Princess, the game world has been inverted on two axes. While that doesn't sound like much, it did make replaying Master Quest feel surprisingly fresh, though I could see fans of the GameCube version finding it disorienting. Third, the difficulty has been retooled. Enemies now do twice as much damage as before. Personally, I didn't notice this myself until an Iron Knuckle took out most of my health bar in one hit, which goes to show how easy this game really is. The increased enemy offense only really matters during the child portion of the game, and in retrospect, I did find myself dying considerably more often than in the previous three playthroughs. By the time you reach adulthood, however, I find the added challenge largely fades. After all, there are still hearts and bottled items to keep your health up, and enemies are easy to defeat without taking damage. Regardless, I respect this attempt at offering a more challenging Ocarina experience to those who have mastered the original. Surprisingly, the boss time attack mode has been revised for the Master Quest expansion as well. I've seen mixed information as to whether the Gauntlet is a Master Quest 3DS exclusive, but I can confirm that the gauntlet is in both the vanilla and Master Quest modes. However, the Master Quest rendition does carry over the half defense of the main quest, and the gauntlet reduces your starting health to three hearts, meaning that the gauntlet is overall harder this time around. Once again, you are forced to refight all the bosses again before you can unlock it, which is even more redundant after I already had to refight them in the main story. Just start me with the gauntlet and get on with it. After a certain point, it just gets cheap, seeing as the bosses can basically one-shot you at only three hearts, and after three other playthroughs, I didn't really have the interest to finish the gauntlet again. However, if you consider yourself the Ocarina Master, then this is definitely the ultimate challenge of your skills. And that's really all I have to say about it. Overall, I consider the 3DS rendition the definitive Master Quest experience. It's the same creatively redesigned dungeons from the GameCube version, except with better visuals, faster text scrolling, and some welcome additional tweaks. Alright, so we've talked about all three versions at length, so... Remake or Rebreak? How well did the GameCube and 3DS re-releases improve upon the N64 original? Let's start with the GameCube version. This, my friends, is a textbook revamp. It's about as lazy and insubstantial a transition as you could possibly imagine. If it weren't for the official release of the Master Quest expansion, which was admittedly the entire point, it would have no purpose in existing. While the 480p resolution is a welcome improvement, the GameCube version fails to update the frame rate, the draw distance, or the performance. The increased resolution only further highlights how ugly the original assets are, and the text speed is still agonizingly slow. That's not to mention the lack of C stick and face button optimization, or the horrific first person aiming sensitivity. Enhanced emulation aside, all of these changes could have been made to the original ROM. Ocarina on GameCube lacks enhancements for want of effort, and that's a shame. With the 60fps frame rate and other gameplay enhancements, this version could have been a credible alternative to the 3DS version, but instead, it's just a huge waste of potential. To its credit though, for the most part, it doesn't really make the game actively worse to play, and it was ultimately sold as a pre 
pre-order bonus for a better game. Consequently, I think a remake is an appropriate score for this game. Disappointing, but inoffensive. The 3DS version, on the other hand, is a textbook replace. If I had a little exo dictionary that defined things like dithering and bilinear filtering, then the illustration for replace would be a picture of Ocarina of Time 3D. I award this score to only the cream of the crop, those re-releases which change, fix, and add so much that they render the original virtually obsolete. And that's exactly what Ocarina 3D does. While I still think the N64 version was a good game, it was riddled with a lot of quirks that make it tedious to replay nowadays. The 3DS version fixes pretty much every issue and even found new content to add on top of it. My single greatest complaint in the original was the god-awful text speed, which has been significantly increased. Now, bored players can readily skip ahead to gameplay if they choose. My second greatest complaint was the visuals, which were ugly and unimpressive even for a 1998 N64 game. Low resolution and aliasing aside, Ocarina 3D overhauls all the character models and provides a much-needed texture facelift while preserving the original art style, significantly increasing the game's visual appeal and allowing it to stand in 2018. With that, my two greatest complaints have been resolved, elevating the 3DS version to remake status. Ocarina 3D then goes the extra mile by taking full advantage of the 3DS's capabilities. The new touchscreen support declutters the interface and allows for more convenient menu navigation, while the added item shortcuts significantly cut down item management. The gyroscope support allows for significantly improved aiming control with options to turn it off if you don't want it. These changes alone justify a replay score, but Grezzo and Nintendo still found new things to add to an already stuffed game. The Master Quest expansion has been included and enhanced with a few welcome tweaks, snuffing out the sole reason to own the GameCube version. It also includes boss time attack and boss rush modes. While these boss modes aren't necessarily my thing, I do appreciate the effort. The only thing about the 3DS version I'm not so keen on is the Sheikah Stone, but that can be easily and safely ignored. I suppose there are other things I might have changed or improved if I was in the designer's chair, but frankly this 3DS remake is about as good as it possibly could have been. Really, I'm having trouble thinking of any advantages to playing the N64 GameCube versions over Ocarina 3D. I've given out replay scores to other games in the past, and for virtually all of them there was at least some kind of trade-off to speak of, however small. The D-pad controls in Super Mario 64 DS are a good example. While I consider them superior to the original controls, it's still a trade-off. Ocarina of Time 3D, meanwhile, doesn't really have a trade-off, besides the fact that you obviously can't play it on a TV. The best thing I can think of is the handful of speedrunning glitches the developers patched out, but apparently some of these were actually left intact, and I personally would never want to speedrun a game with text this slow, but I'm not a speedrunner, so take that with a grain of salt. The more I think about it, the clearer it becomes. Ocarina of Time 3D replaces the original for me, pure and simple. Of course, you're welcome to prefer whichever version you want, but the uninitiated player should skip those over and pick up Ocarina Ocarina 3D instead. All that leaves is my impressions of Ocarina of Time in general. Going into this review, I received a lot of tweets from excited fans telling me that Ocarina is their favorite game, and believe me, I can absolutely respect that. Fact is, every game ever made has some kind of flaw, whether they be scant and minor or numerous and major, and lord knows my own favorite games are no stranger to this. So if this is one of your favorite games, then I have absolutely no problem with that. But as far as the critical perception that Ocarina of Time on N64 is not only a favorite game, but one of the best, which seems to be echoed by the gaming community, I can't help but raise both eyebrows. I used to say that Ocarina was the Bagot contender whose nomination I understood the most, but after playing it again for this review, I'm not even sure I can agree with that. This video game, which critics have described as a masterpiece, timeless, and the closest thing to a perfect game features a choppy substandard frame rate, slow, unskippable cutscenes, an overly large overworld and inconvenient navigation, dated, awkwardly written dialogue, and blurry, unappealing visuals even for the year of release. That's not to say that there aren't things about Ocarina of Time that are legitimately impressive. 
The single button camera control and the Z targeting system were brilliant forward thinking ideas that helped the core mechanics stand the test of time. And I absolutely have to give Nintendo credit for pulling off a near flawless 2D to 3D transition gameplay wise in a time when many developers were still shackled to a 2D game design mentality. As my comparisons with Star Fox Adventures show, there's a lot that could have gone wrong in the hands of different designers. The dungeon design, particularly in the adult portion of the game, is still really solid to this day, and considering that this was Nintendo's first stab at 3D dungeon design, that deserves kudos. The soundtrack is also great and a highlight of the series, and obviously three out of the five big negatives I mentioned were fixed in the 3DS remake. But even for all the improvements in Ocarina 3D, I still feel like the series has nevertheless come a long way since 1998. When I'm in a dungeon, which is the meat and potatoes of Zelda, Zelda, after all, I'm really enjoying myself. During the rest of the game, however, I'm just kind of bored, honestly, especially during the first third. Granted, I doubt I could play even my favorite games four times back to back without getting bored, but that's nevertheless how I felt even during my first run on the N64. I just feel like future 3D Zelda games do everything Ocarina does, but with comparatively better visuals, stronger dungeon design, more convenient navigation, and more engaging narratives. Ocarina feels more like a strong starting point for the 3D series rather rather than its pinnacle. As much as I prefer 3D Zelda overall, I would sooner replay A Link to the Past than pop an Ocarina again. But that's just my own two cents. Bottom line, for me, Ocarina of Time is a good game, but nothing more. Even if it isn't one of my favorite games, I can definitely respect its legacy on 3D game design. Well that's another episode of Remake or Rebreak done and over with. It only took me four months. So naturally, the topic turns to what comes next. While talking about mediocre remakes is important, for the time being, I'd really like to look at some more 3DS stuff. After all, I didn't buy the capture card for nothing. As for which game precisely? Well, I think I'm gonna let you guys decide. Keep an eye out for a poll on the community tab where you guys get to vote on which 3DS re-release I'll cover next. Until next time, I'm Exoparadigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review. Hey folks, hope you all enjoyed the latest episode. Sorry it took so long to come out. I just wanted to draw some attention to some other places you guys can go find me. Uh, first there's EPG Plays, that's my solo Let's Play channel where I play video games and talk about them. I'm finishing up a playthrough of Spyro 3 right now, as well as Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast with my friend Ryan. So definitely go check that out, uh, I do streams there too. Then we have the Inverse Cast, which I do with my buddies Ryan, King K, and Hadox. We talk about video games and read bad fan fiction. Come check it out, it's a lot of fun. Finally, there's an EPG fan discord created by a fan named Raving Dave. Bless him for his patience, he's been waiting for me to announce it on the channel here for a long time, so yeah, links in the description, definitely go check that out, and I'm sure Raving Dave will leave a comment as well. So yeah, definitely go check all of those out, and I'll see you guys next time for a new review. Bye!